So I have a Dr. Romney confession to make. I was totally starstruck when actress Rebecca Humphreys joined the podcast. Of course, I'd seen her on The Crown, but there's something else you should know about me. Every morning at 5.45 a.m., I wake up and I read the tabloids for half an hour. Consider it my form of entertainment. I felt like I got a front row seat to Rebecca's story in the British tabloids as I watched it unfold from the comfort of my bed. The cheating, the scandal, the public gaslighting, and then, finally, the one in a million chance she got to prove to her gaslighter and the world that she was right all along. So when I got to finally meet her, I felt incredibly invested in her journey like I'd lived it with her. I love the way Rebecca describes how gaslighting feels and how damaging it can be, how it starts small and before you know it, consumes everything you thought you knew about yourself. If you've been cheated on, gaslighted, doubted, and emotionally abused, Rebecca's story will resonate with you. This podcast should not be used as a substitute for medical or mental health advice. Individuals are advised to seek independent medical advice, counseling, and or therapy from a healthcare professional with respect to any medical condition, mental health issue, or health inquiry, including matters discussed on this podcast. This episode discusses abuse, which may be triggering to some people. The views and opinions expressed are solely those of the podcast author or individuals participating in the podcast and do not represent the opinions of Red Table Talk Productions, iHeartMedia, or their employees. I walked out that night that those pictures were in the newspapers. I didn't have a boyfriend. I didn't have a home. I didn't have a job. I didn't have any income anymore. But what I did have was, it turns out, more self-respect than I would ever have given myself credit for. And a voice and my worth all of a sudden. It's amazing to me how often survivors say, I had an intuition that something wasn't right. And between my partner's gaslighting, other people telling me that maybe I'm overthinking it, and me telling myself I am too sensitive, I pushed it away and I ignored it. Now imagine that you have this intuition. You have this feeling in your gut that was gaslighted by your partner many times. And you find out not only that you were right all along, also that it gets confirmed by a picture of your partner cheating on you on the front cover of every newspaper in the country. Welcome to the story of Rebecca Humphreys. Rebecca is a writer and actress from the UK and has been on shows including The Crown and 10%. Her best-selling memoir, Why Did You Stay? A memoir about self-worth, may be one of the very best I have read on gaslighting, infidelity, and the slow burn and confusion of emotional abuse. Her Twitter post on emotional abuse in gaslighting might be one of my most favorite Twitter posts of all time and ended up putting her in a role she never expected, advocate. And since then, Rebecca has become a thoughtful and empathic voice on emotional abuse, gaslighting, and their impact on self-worth and well-being, as well as the importance of recognizing these patterns in crafting policy. While Rebecca's public story was easy tabloid fodder, her deeper exploration of how a person finds themselves in the complicated dance of a relationship that twists between gaslighting and invalidation and comfort and charisma provides a framework for understanding why so many people get into emotionally abusive relationships and find themselves stuck in them. Let's hear Rebecca's story beyond just what was in the tabloids. We have Rebecca Humphreys. You are the standard bearer of one of the ultimate relationship stories. And what's so interesting is, though, although your story played out on such a public stage, what you shared was the experience of so many survivors who often feel as though they're under the radar 
because it doesn't register as what we sort of traditionally consider sort of the physical injuries and wounds of domestic abuse. A lot of people don't even want to call it abuse. They want to call it a difficult relationship. So what you've done is you've given voice, as people are trying to do more and more now, but you've done it in a voice that made me laugh and cry. And we'll talk about your book endlessly because everyone immediately must read Why Did You Stay? One of the best memoirs of this. So Some people have heard about your story, but can you take us from the top? And before we even get into the tweet and dancing and all of that, can we get into your book and into your story? Talk to us about your relationship. Okay. So in 2013, I met a man on the set of a television show that he and I were both cast in. And I was with someone else at the time. Very quickly, it became clear that we had chemistry and even quicker off the off the back of that, hot on the heels of that, he sort of began this pursuit of me, which sounds like I was reluctant in that. I absolutely wasn't. I mean, it was, it was presents and gifts and voyages to different countries all over Europe. And uh, it really did feel like for a brief moment of my life that the sun was shining on me and that romance was playing out in exactly the way that I'd always been told that it would do my whole <laughs> life from countless movies and period dramas and everything that I'd ever been promised was sort of handed to me by this person. And then really, when I think back on it, quite quickly, well, extremely quickly, we we moved in together within three weeks. We had bought a house within three months. And mm. quickly after that, it started to become complicated in a way that really I had never, I had never expected, sure, but I had never been warned about or had never been encouraged to see those things as signs that this was an emotionally abusive relationship. I just thought it was a relationship. I just thought it was one that had, you know, teething problems and required compromise Mm. and all of these really like unhelpful roller decks of sound bites that I'd been taught about relationships and what love looked like. And that relationship went on for five and a half years. And it was at the end of it, when it sort of exploded in a media bin fire. And at which point I sort of got this amazing wash of validation from the national press. And also because of the publicness of the breakup, lots of women contacting me privately, letting me know that essentially this person had been one person to me and an entirely another person to all of these other women who he had several affairs with and dismissed my suspicions as me being crazy for years. So the publicness of it, which we're going to get to in a minute, while you were in the relationship, Rebecca, Mm -hmm. were you aware that this wasn't good, this wasn't healthy? Like you said, three weeks in was sort of intense in the I love you's. Three months in, we're buying a house. I mean, that's fast, which is already a big red flag. But beyond that, five and a half years is a long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a really long time. Like, (laughs) there was even, I was, by the end of this relationship, I doubted myself to such an extent that it even feels strange to say five and a half years is a long time of my life. Because when we got out of the relationship and I was dealing with the way that I felt I had been treated and the things that had happened, I was sort of asking people, like, that's a long time, right? That's too Mm -hmm. long for this to be going on, you know? Mm Just that kind of validation even now feels strangely, you know, sort of brilliant. (laughs) It's a long time to suffer like that. It's interesting. Five and a half years in a happy relationship is an eye blink. Five and a half (laughs) years in an emotionally abusive relationship is like an epoch. It's an entirely (laughs) different game. So while you were in it, in those five and a half years, how aware were you becoming that this isn't right? Or how did you manage what was happening in the relationship? Well, the fact is that I was relatively inexperienced when it came to... Mm relationships and what healthy relationships look like. Mm -hmm. To be honest, I come from a background where actually there isn't that much emotional language and that we don't really have a dialogue in that sense. So my first relationship was with somebody who also didn't do that and also didn't communicate in that way. And it became clear that we Mm. were quite young and that we were sort of going on different paths. And to me, that just felt really confusing. And so when I met this person, who the person that we're talking about, who I was in this emotionally abusive relationship with, I really just saw all of the things that 
my first boyfriend was missing. And because really I'm, I'm also from a background that is, dare I say it, and I don't mean to be derogatory when I say this, but it's patriarchal and mm-hmm. love and marriage and children is a priority. And whether I liked it or not, I was conditioned from an early age to prioritize romantic love over everything else, including myself. Mm. So when I'm in a relationship with somebody, I'm going to try and keep it going no matter the cost. And in the case of this relationship, that cost was my self-esteem, my opinions, my voice. And so how did I work around that? Well, I just stopped voicing myself as much. I sort of allowed my opinions to be watered down to the extent that actually I sort of, you can ask me what I wanted for dinner. Mm. I wouldn't Mm -hmm. have been able to answer you. Mm -hmm. I would have texted my boyfriend and asked what he wanted. All of the things really that I now know I really do value about myself and that I really love and enjoy about who I am, they were the first things to be thrown out of the window in the name of love. Rebecca highlights three patterns here that have come out throughout this podcast and that she puts a finer point on. First, we again see this idea of how a narcissistic relationship can so often feel like a correction from a prior relationship, especially when that prior relationship lacked something. In her case, it was communication. When someone comes up with just lots, lots of talking and contact and all of that, especially if we came from a relationship when we didn't have that, we can make the erroneous assumption that the intensity and sort of the extra of it all is good and healthy. Then she gets into something that we don't talk about enough, which is the tyranny of romantic love and that love and marriage and baby carriages are the be-all, end-all. Healthy relationships are a magnificent and essential part of a healthy life. But the script and the idea that someone is coming up short if they aren't living in that script rushes too many people into toxic relationships, and they don't give themselves to be discerning when they choose a partner or stay in a relationship and say, I am better than this. And then she makes a really important point. She says that when I am in a relationship with someone, I am going to try and keep it going no matter the cost. And that right there is a perfect definition of what a trauma-bonded relationship looks like. I will give up on myself. I will disconnect from who I am and what I need to do to keep this going. Rebecca is describing a one, two, three punch here that I do not think anyone could ever be immune to. And it is the perfect setup to get into and get stuck in a manipulative toxic, and invalidating relationship. I want to even go further back. So prior to this unhealthy, emotionally abusive relationship, how many boyfriend, like longer term, not just dates, but like longer term relationships, was it just the one? Just one, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And in that one, it wasn't like this. Firstly, it was a completely different time. We started going out in around 2009. Now at the same time as this, he had girlfriends that he told me that he'd broken up with. Now, he hadn't. He was a cowardly (laughs) dude, this guy. He hadn't. But of course, at that time, it all came out about the pair of us. And the way that pop culture and society was working at that point was to cast the women in two very clear roles. One as the one who was the girlfriend or the wife, who was the innocent party, and the other as the sort of siren, mm-hmm. whore to the Madonna, really. And so as such, this guy was let off the hook by absolutely everyone that knew us, including myself. So <laughs> as far as I was concerned, during this relationship, I'd sort of stolen him from mm-hmm. his girlfriend, <laughs> which, you know... Now I look back on and I think, hang on, this this really has, society's got a lot to answer for in that respect. Because had I have been able to shine a light on his behavior in that way, who knows whether I would have found myself in a relationship with this other guy, because I probably would have recognized a lot of the same behavior. But actually, I took on a lot of that blame at the beginning of that relationship with this guy. I really did. And I did a lot of apologizing at the beginning of that relationship that actually meant that when I met this new boyfriend, I sort of felt like everything about our beginning was very clean. 
and felt almost almost pure and 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 like love was supposed to be which is just arriving and I stepped into something free from blame judgment and attack which I hadn't previously does that make sense it makes so much sense and you just said a mouthful let's just put it that way (laughs) because first of all you said back in 2009 women were either painted as Madonna or whore siren or the steady girlfriend I think in 2022 is exactly the same. I don't think we've made progress on that front whatsoever, frankly. So I think we're still very much stuck in that. But what was interesting to me, you said that in childhood, you were raised to believe romantic love took primacy, marriage was the goal, marriage, family. In the United States, we talk about the picket fence, the whole thing. Exactly. You're right? That was the goal, right? Yeah, it's that little shop of horrors dream sequence. <laughs> but, but you're absolutely right. It is the dream sequence of, I'm going to have that domesticity. And that means... Everything else in my life can be put on hold as long as I'm working on this. But what's fascinating is you say in that first relationship, you had to take a role of the siren as the bad one, as the person who came in as a bad actor, as it were, because you got into the relationship that he lied about being in with somebody else. And people perceived you as, well, of course she knew and she did this willingly. So you had a role there Mm -hmm. and you took the role on. But what's fascinating, and this happens all the time, Rebecca, is when a person moves into a new relationship and the new story is different than the old story, and in this case, it was that clean beginning, it almost becomes what we call a halo effect in psychology, which is this idea that now this is going to be a good relationship because that piece was moved out of the way. (laughs) Once again, you're blowing my mind. (laughs) Even just saying the halo effect, I'm like, because so much of our relationship that we had over those five years, I just took it straight back to that angelic beginning. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting is that's all, his, his main virtue I'm hearing so far is that he happened to be single when you met him. (laughs) So you had this one relationship and then that ends. How long did that first relationship last? I'd say about two years, two and a half years. Okay. Still not a short period of time. You wouldn't call it toxic? No, I wouldn't have called it a toxic relationship. No. Okay. Okay. And you were young? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was young. I was 23. How much time elapsed between the end of that first relationship and the beginning of the second relationship? Oh, (laughs) I mean, a day. So you, you met the new guy almost right away. I met the new guy when we were both working on this TV show and I still had a boyfriend. But yes, me and the new guy, we were friends. We finished this TV show that was his TV show, actually. And he said that he wanted to take me and the lead writer out for dinner and drinks at this club in London. And when I turned up, the writer wasn't there. (laughs) And we had some drinks. And I said to this guy, he was never coming, was he? And he said, no. And I said, Can, I need you to tell me why. Mm-hmm. And he said, because I'm madly in love with you. Yeah, she shouted it in this club, you know. And Wow. Yeah. And I sort of said, okay, leave it with me. Because as well, you know, this guy, this is also part of this halo effect that you're talking about, which is this guy, the, my first boyfriend, you know, there, was a, there were many, many months of a tussle and a back and forth about him not being able to leave his girlfriend and telling me that he had left her and then telling me that it wouldn't work and for whatever reason and me never quite figuring out whether this was true. And the whole thing was a tussle. And then suddenly it felt, honestly, after years as well, and not just with this first boyfriend, but my teenage years of feeling like a secret from so many boys and men and feeling like lots of men were ashamed to say that they were with me. And then suddenly I'm with this new guy and it's like the clouds part and the sun shines on me and someone just turns around to me and goes, no, 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 no. I want you how you are. And I want everyone to know about it. And suddenly it just felt, you know, after all of this secrecy and shame for years and years and years, this was, as I say, totally clean. And I was like, this is meant to happen. It felt like, yeah, it felt like a sort of fate thing, really. Well, it's such an interesting sort of passing of the baton. In all of those prior relationships, you were choosing these men. And like you said, it was almost like they wouldn't commit. You were felt you were kept in the shadows, you know, which is an interesting kind of a triangulated trauma bonded pattern where people will be with someone where, and they may not even be that they're competing with another person, but they're competing with something, even if it's the desire to not be in a relationship for that, yeah. for the, for the man. Then when you transition to new guy, 
to this, I'm going to call him number two for lack of a name. But, you know, this, <laughs> this new guy, he chooses you. But what's interesting, Rebecca, and what I'm hearing is that you were still in a somewhat disadvantaged position because you were still the bad one. You hurt number one. Yeah, that's right. I did. So you still were in this this position of Rebecca not as good. Hmm. And I find that interesting because that would probably make you more likely to endure more of number two's bad behavior. Because even though he chose you, you still came in from that disadvantaged spot. That is absolutely fascinating. Yeah, that's really, really interesting. So now, though, you end the relationship with number one, number two, and it goes fast. It goes fast. And also, you know, there's there's something else to add to this, which is that we went on this date. We went to Brighton on the south coast of England. And I remember us having a big conversation. And I said to him, I don't know if I want to be in a relationship with the minute. I think I just need time. And it was almost as though he it was a red rag to a bull that moment. It was, well, I want you mm-hmm. to be my girlfriend. And that's what I want. And of course, you know, I, all the work that I've done ever since on myself and on thinking about myself and what well, that moment was, I really have come to terms with the fact that I didn't take into account my own needs at all in that scenario. I heard what he wanted and I sort of like, it it chills me to the bone really that I was so prepared so instantly to fulfill his needs in that sense, rather than ground myself in my own in any sense. It was as though, honestly, Mm -hmm. I just turned my back on it within two seconds because I saw it as my chance. I saw this moment as my chance, which obviously has a lot to do with my own self-esteem at that point in my life. Yeah. But it also sounds like the message you got is to be in a relationship meant that you you fully had to almost sacrifice all your needs to the other. That was love. Totally. The sequence Rebecca described, meeting someone new, things moving fast, but then asking for a minute because she wasn't sure she was ready for a relationship She likened it to a red flag for a bull, which is an apt metaphor. Toxic and antagonistic folks love the game, the chase, and the win. Many people actually do set the boundary and communicate that they may need time or may not be ready, and all the other person hears is game on. I know that lots of people look back at these relationships and say, how could I have missed it? And I remind them that you probably did try to set a boundary, but you just didn't know what you were up against. So as this relationship went on, and if anyone reads the book, and like I said, the book lays it out in such excruciating but unbelievably lyrical detail, can you give listeners a sort of a glimpse at what some of the more toxic patterns were in the relationship and, you know, how that played out for you internally. These things would happen. You were clear that they were uncomfortable, yet it was a cycle, like as we often see in these relationships, of it falling apart, coming back together. What were the kinds of things that would happen and what was your process within the relationship? Patterns included, the obvious one is is the breadcrumbing. So is the really being distant physically and emotionally for, I would say, 70 to 90% of the time until there was just enough resistance from me that I would then be bombarded or swamped with love and with Mm. attention and affection, just enough to stop me from walking out the door. And there were several moments within our relationship where I really had had enough and said, I can't do this anymore, I really can't. And at which point, suddenly there would be this man who was everything that I had been missing for months and months and months right there willing to give me everything that it was I had said enough is enough I can't do without this Mm -hmm. in in my life so that was one thing other things you know like sudden there'd be sudden thoughtfulness like sudden gifts of things that I had mentioned in passing that it suddenly felt as though he had been thoughtful enough to kind of log that away and suddenly there would be this gift and I would think well things are going to be better now and then two days three days later suddenly there we go sinking back in but I'm there remembering that gift and remembering that thoughtfulness and almost feeding myself from it through that and and also you know I was a thrill seeker in that relationship in that sense I really was because I said in the book that 
this kind of a relationship is like someone pushing you from a 15 story building and then catching you an inch above the pavement. And then when they catch you an inch above the pavement, all you can say is thank you so much for catching me because you're so relieved to not have hit the ground that you forget that they're the person that kicked you off that building in the first place. And it was It was like that in the initial stages, every few months, and then it became every few weeks, and then it became every few days towards the end, by which point you're so accustomed to that cycle. You don't even realize that you're in a cycle. You just think that this is how the relationship is. And also, you know full well that no matter how bleak it gets, chances are it will probably take a couple of days for something good to happen and you can laugh together again. And so you ride it out, you ride the wave of difficulty because my favorite place to exist was the moment where the relationship was freshly salvaged. And that's where I I got my life force from every, every single time. So I would say that that was really the main one. And those instances that, again, I speak about anecdotally in the book, like, you know, I'm I'm crying in a Pizza Express in a West London shopping centre in a Westfield, you know, feeling bleaker than I've ever felt in my life. And, you know, this waiter above me with a big pepper grinder and me crying my eyes out going, oh God, this is so humiliating. And leaving and saying, you know, enough's enough. I can't do this anymore. And I deserve better than this. Suddenly this empowerment comes out of me. I'm leaving and I'm going and I'm going home. And then suddenly out it comes, which is the, I need you. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what I would do if you left. And suddenly we get into the territory of responsibility and me taking responsibility for this person who's, I know full well, has had difficulty in their lives because that gets brought up too in, in moments where I have my own sense of power and my own sense of autonomy, difficulties that this person he's been through in his life and his childhood and things that I can't possibly imagine. And suddenly there I am saying, but he needs me. And without me, he's saying he doesn't know what he'd do. And I don't know what it is to have had a childhood, a teenage life, an adult life like him. So maybe if I'd had that, then I would understand it better, Mm. but I don't. But all I know now is that if I left, he'd have nothing. And I love him, so I don't wish that on him. There are so many things like that, they just creep into your veins in relationships like this. And you're living with them in your body, not even realizing that this is anything other than a, a normal relationship, because because it is your normal, it becomes your normal. One thing you've laid out here is we talk about the architecture of a narcissistic relationship, an toxic relationship, and it's love bombing, devaluing, discarding, and hoovering. They suck <laughs> you back in, Starts again, and the gift, and then the devalue, and then the discard, which can also be with withdrawing. It doesn't mean they end the relationship. It just means that they withdraw, or they they spend time with other people or other pursuits, and then they hoover you back. Mm-hmm. A lot of people think that, that that's a one-time cycle, and it's not. Yours was an example of what was happening weekly, monthly, and I think that that's what I want. I want folks to hear that. People think it's a one time, and I'm like, no, 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 no. This happens over and over and over. The cycle is not a one cycle. It's a constant cycle. But yours is, it's a classic trauma-bonded cycle. That idea of over time, the cycle became more frequent, and that mm-hmm. analogy you give, which is just brilliant, of falling out of the building and being caught an inch from the pavement, and then sort of getting really hooked into the ecstasy of the being caught, of the yeah. what is the coming together going to look like again, that that becomes the hook. That right there is the trauma bond. And I think that so many people say, oh, I'm trauma bonded. What's wrong with me? I'm like, what's wrong with you? You're basically holding out for this thing that feels like a reward. That's actually human nature. But it's human nature caught up in this really toxic cycle. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Just to add to that too, I think a lot of people think that when you hear things like a toxic cycle, it's a mistake to think that a toxic relationship is toxic all the time. Right. Because within that cycle, there were the most amazing glimpses and moments of real intimacy and romance and pleasure and all of these things that 
suddenly there I am, you know, seeing the sea in Brighton from that first weekend that we went away together. And it's it's there and it's real. And that was peppered throughout those five and a half years, those beautiful, truly beautiful moments. But that doesn't mean that it wasn't a toxic relationship. <laughs> it, it means that that's part of the cycle of it. Correct. And, and it's in a way what happens is those memories almost become these etchings in those parts of your brain where you're also trying to manage emotion. And that gets challenging because it's like having beautiful family pictures on the wall and thinking, I'm in an unhappy family, but the pictures don't tell that that story. And so you're always looking up at this big gallery of photos. They just happen to be in your mind all the time. Our session will continue after this break. One thing you brought up a lot in your book and when you've talked about the relationship is that you constantly felt gaslighted in the relationship. You know, so in addition to the breadcrumbing, it sounds like gaslighting was a dynamic. So when things weren't going well, that would show up. How would gaslighting show up in your relationship? I don't think I I could count on one hand how many times my hurt, trauma, sadness, disappointment was credited or was Mm -hmm. listened to in a sensitive, responsive way. What I can remember a lot of is, what's wrong with you, psychopath? A lot. Mm -hmm. And I mean, examples where this withdrawal would happen, and I could feel, Dr. Romney, I'm telling you, I could feel my body, I could feel the voice of my body saying to me, something is wrong. This person is lying. And not only that, they're a slapdash liar because the way that they're even talking to you isn't convincing. And I would express that and say, I don't believe what you're saying or why do I feel like you're pulling away from me or why do I feel like there's something going on with this woman or why do I feel like Mm -hmm. you weren't where you said you were? And I would get, because you're crazy or Mm -hmm. because you're psychotic. And then, of course, that's so complex because what happens is when you hear that enough in your relationship, you learn not to voice your opinions because you're just going to get met with that. A gaslighted and narcissistic relationship is a slow silencing. You may begin by sharing concerns, fears, intuition, and be told so many times that you are crazy or paranoid or psychotic that you simply stop, which was exactly her experience. Your intuition is always on. The abuse is what turns it off. Rebecca also lays out so clearly here what gaslighting does to a person. It shifts our identity and our sense of who we are and how we go through the world. Many people in these relationships who always saw themselves as well-regulated, thoughtful, well-considered people will begin to believe that they're reactive, unhinged, and out of control of their emotions. And so we play the game out in our head. If I say this, then they'll tell me I'm crazy. If I do that, then they'll tell me I'm paranoid. And in Rebecca's case, it was even worse. He was using his narrative about her behavior to validate his own acting out. Gaslighting doesn't just deny reality. It is ultimately a denial of the self. Also, once you are met with that answer, and once that narrative is written for you, that you're the psychotic one who can't control their emotions, and suddenly there you are feeling sad all the time because you think your brain doesn't work and there's something wrong with you, rather than you know, respecting and listening to what you actually feel, which is that your partner is doing something untoward, you start to gaslight yourself. Before you've even opened your mouth, you're saying, well, there's no point in saying that because you're doing that crazy thing that you do again. And then before you know what's happening, you're living inside a prison, your own head, your own body. And that, of course, suits this person because it's facilitating their own bad behavior. I mean, that was constant. And then, of course, what happens, as we mentioned, with the publicness of our breakup was that I had this whoosh of validation because the very person that that my partner was photographed with and that was on the front pages of the UK tabloid press 
one Sunday morning was the very woman that I had accused him of having an affair with. And he had told me that I was a psychopath. And then more and more women came forward because of the publicness. And I was like, oh, I remember that. Manchester 2017. I remember that. That was Norwich 2016. I remember when he came back from tour. And all of these instances, just, you know, like a montage in front of my head. I was like, oh, it felt like, honestly, as well, lots of people have said to me that must have been really difficult. I was like, honestly, honey, like, it felt like, a whoosh of validation every single time. I felt like I had had my brain handed back to me by default. It's relatively rare for survivors of gaslighting to get their gaslight turned off. Yeah. To have the experience you had. To have somebody come and provide the evidence and tell you you were not wrong. Yeah. The fantasy for many people is that that would come from the gaslighter. That's never going to (laughs) happen. But that idea of getting your brain back, there is no greater... uh, It's almost like when those those home shows where someone comes in and cleans your whole house and you're like, everything's so organized. (laughs) Each time somebody comes in and ungaslights, you're like, oh, look, everything's where it needs to be. This is great. Right? Right? It's like everything's tidy and, and clean and I actually feel like I could function in this space again. And so when you would find, like you would have these suspicions and you would say... I'm concerned about this, or this doesn't add up, or where were you, or why don't you want me to be here, or why don't you want me to join you, whatever the reasons were. And he'd pull back and push back and say, you're paranoid, you're a psychopath, there's something wrong with you. During the relationship, before the big public breakup, Mm -hmm. did you ever catch him out in the lies? Like, for example, I'm hearing that he shut you down by telling you you're a psychopath, but did he ever attempt to rationalize his bad behavior? Yes. Well, I mean, he's he was a stand-up comedian. Mm. So there was lots of touring. There was lots of being away from home. There was one instance where I found a phone number in his jacket pocket. And I used to have these really strange, like vivid fantasies when I would, you know, be as I, you know, my most Medea-like, as I've put it before, sort of, you know, desperate for some kind of validation and revenge and out for blood, really. And I found this thing in his jacket pocket and there was lots of, what am I supposed to do if women throw themselves at me when I'm on tour? You know, that's not my fault. There was lots of that. And I was like, you know, at the time thinking, oh, I said to him, well, you don't take the number and you say, I have a girlfriend. And there was some kind of back and forth about how that makes him feel awkward and embarrassed because what if it's that that's not what they meant. And the thing that really strikes me is one instance many, many years ago, which was only about nine months into our relationship when we were living together, we bought this house together. And I found some explicit messages on Facebook that he had been sharing with a woman. He was out one Saturday night and we had a shared laptop. And I went onto Facebook and he must not have logged out. He didn't log into Facebook very often, but I did. And he must not have logged out from it because it just came straight up on the screen. And I found a heap of explicit messages to this one woman. And I mean, I called him up and I said to him, who's her name? And he said, who? And I had to detail exactly what I'd saw. You know, is that trigger your memory? And straight away, I was like, we're done. I'm done. Let's go. I left. He really, really pursued me to hear him out. He had a bit of an apathetic assistant. So he had a a good mate who was a really, really good guy and who is a really good guy. He's sort of a family man and with children and very, you know, and he and he really reasoned with me on behalf of on behalf of my boyfriend. And when we met up, it was a one off drunken mistake, he said, which I'm truly sorry for. And everyone's allowed to make a mistake. This is an interesting sequence and not uncommon in toxic relationships, getting someone else to do their bidding. And it's even more powerful when the person doing the bidding for the toxic person is legitimate in some way. In this case, it was because this guy was a family man. The narcissistic person will often mobilize other people to come to their rescue. And since they're always surrounded by enablers and people can't see what these patterns are, people will step up. It makes it really hard for someone in one of these relationships because when other people are using tried and true defenses like everybody makes a mistake, involving another person will often raise more doubt 
for the person harmed by a narcissistic person. And this sense that, well, other people think my partner is cool, so maybe I'm the one who's being too stubborn or demanding. It's not lost on me that her ex, in this cowardly way, had a friend step in when he had clearly done something wrong. It put Rebecca in an untenable position and sadly got her stuck for longer. I just thought, you know what? Yeah, they are. They are allowed to make mistakes. And what am I going to be? Stubborn for stubborn sake. I've got this man right opposite me and he loves me and I love him and I'm prepared to forego any kind of insecurity that I feel about this and try and make this work. And let me tell you something. Very quickly after that instant, I can't tell you quite when, very quickly after that instance, me finding explicit messages to another woman on Facebook became, why were you spying on me on Facebook anyway? Mm -hmm. Which then very quickly became separate laptops and passwords and sermons on the importance of privacy and lectures on why it's very important for the two of us to lead separate lives and have secrets, you know? And it would all, and, and, and imparted to me in sort of very elevated, holier than that ways. Self-righteousness is just so, it's so powerful. One thing that I'm hearing here, and I know a lot of people have said this to me, they've said that the gaslighting be, why are you so sensitive? Why are you so paranoid? Why are you so this, you know, you're, you're a psychopath, this, that, and the other, right? And people over time will internalize that because this really is a, it, it, these relationships aren't about falling in love. They're about being indoctrinated into the controlling abusive system of the narcissistic person. And what people do over time is they equate strength with not having emotional reactions to being betrayed. Oh, I could not put that better myself. Right? I'm being betrayed. I'm being shamed. I'm being humiliated. I'm being pathologized. But I'll show him I'm not going to say anything. Right? So that idea of dissociating yourself from yourself is look how strong I am. I'm like, that's like the worst, most unhealthy thing that can happen. <laughs> you are talking my language. Honestly, I've said it so many times to friends over, you know, God knows how many glasses of Sauvignon Blanc that... <laughs> I am, I just cannot believe that I allowed myself to use my strength, like something that mm. I have prided myself on, you know, for years. It's like there was a version of me that my strength stepped out of my body and turned slowly around like in a horror film at me, <laughs> you know? I was at war with myself and I thought that it was my greatest asset in this relationship. But I was using my strength against myself in order to enable him. Correct, because what you were doing is your strength meant, I'm going to cut off all parts of Rebecca. So really <laughs> all that's left is this shell of myself that lives in his service. Oh my gosh, yeah, absolutely, in his orbit. And his Exactly, so he was the sun and all human beings in his life were the planets orbiting around him. And that was it. There was no other function for anyone. Absolutely, no, the world only only existed as far as he could see it. Correct. And it was that that self-serving, that egocentric. And then what he would do is he would weaponize his backstory. <laughs> I went through this. I went through that. I've been through this. I've been through that. So that that sort of, you know, taking out the, the victimization and using it as a weapon, effectively ending the conversation. Oh, I mean, what could I say <laughs> at that, 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 that time, you know? What could I? What can I possibly say to that? There's there really is no argument. I mean, if and, and I didn't have the at the time, well, self love really or self nurturing to say that's not relevant to this conversation because I'm still entitled to my feelings and I'm entitled to how I feel, irrespective of what it is we've been through. Because there's there's different. There's a different facet. It's mm -hmm. a different mm -hmm. lane, and it reminds me actually quite a lot of during that time in that relationship. I stepped away from so many conversations mm -hmm. like the ones that you and I are having now, which I take hu a huge amount of pleasure in having. Mm -hmm. And stepped away from women, well, women full stop really, but it's because throughout that relationship, especially at the end of the relationship, it's like I saw, I saw every woman through his eyes and I could identify within the first mm -hmm. three seconds whether they were a threat or safe. Mm -hmm. Truly, because I just saw what he saw. And I especially found un unimaginably threatening women who 
were most like my full self and most like the person that I was before I met him because I that on some level it's as though I knew that if I continued the conversation with these women if I you know developed myself in the way that they were you know free to develop because they had nothing at stake or so I believed I would find out that I shouldn't be in this relationship Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. So I just stopped having those conversations and I stayed where I was. I stayed in, in the same place. Many survivors know at some deep, unspoken level that if they stop shrinking themselves to stay in the relationship or actually explore it honestly and deeply, that they will find out that they probably have to leave it. As a result, survivors may avoid therapy avoid talking to friends who will tell them the truth, and even avoid the people that allow them to grow because there is a fear that then they would have to act on that information. It's sort of the ignorance is bliss model. But in this case, it's not so much bliss as self-sabotage meets self-protection. Part of your book that really was so striking to me, you're in Denmark, with your friend. And in fact, you do this beautiful, beautiful equating the original Hans Christian Andersen story about the Little (laughs) Mermaid. And, you know, the piece we forget is in the original telling of the story (laughs) is that she makes all those sacrifices and, and her legs feel like knives are going through them and she loses her voice and all of that. And the prince still rejects her. That part of your book gave me chills. Yeah. But on that trip, at that point... Your partner had already been chosen to be on the next season of of Strictly Come Dancing, which Mm -hmm. for listeners, it's like uh, Dancing with the Stars in the States. And then you said to your friend, I don't feel good about this. I can already see where this is going to go. And even your friend, who's been nothing but a support, is like, you're already thinking ahead to that. Almost like you've created this story in your head. But as I read that part of the story, your instincts were spot on. Like you knew him better than he knew himself at this point. Oh, I knew. Right? And then you were like, I don't feel comfortable with this. But in the same breath, you're like, I want to be the supportive girlfriend. So I need to support him doing the very thing that I know is going to harm me. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It was such a feeling of helplessness because, as we've said, you know, what was at stake for me was everything that I've ever been told that I needed and how Mm -hmm. I am a a valid adult woman. Mm -hmm. And so there I am. I'm in this extreme state of helplessness where I can choose to follow my instincts here and lose my relationship, or I can put my instincts to one side and choose to be supportive and lose myself. And at that point in my relationship, losing myself felt like, well, if I'm totally candid, it, it felt like the only option at that point for me, because I was so, as you pointed out, trauma bonded with this person that Mm. I couldn't imagine a life without him. I I really couldn't. And I just, I would sit in this relationship and I would sit in bed at night and I would, you know, be up, not being able to sleep. And I love sleep. So that's how I always know that I, I, you know, something's really, really (laughs) wrong here. But I would just think, I can't believe that this is my life. I can't believe this this is what Mm -hmm. my my life is. But there was always a part of me that was saying to myself, but if you left, it could be worse, you know? Think about what you have got. Mm -hmm. Think about what you have Mm -hmm. got. You've got this partner who is successful and has an an incredible income. You have a a flat aged, you know, 27 years old. That's, you know, that's completely impossible in London. (laughs) Like that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have a successful partner who's famous and every single person in your life thinks you've landed on your feet. Why? Mm-hmm. What's wrong with you? Why don't you? Yeah. And yet the thing you're missing in there is, is Rebecca getting to be her whole, full, authentic self and be loved for her. And that wasn't on the table. And there ain't no flat in the world that can be better than that. And yet we talk oh. ourselves out of it. So he goes on to Strictly Come Dancing. Mm-hmm. He starts dancing with this <laughs> partner where mm, it, it, this doesn't feel good. But you would show up to the tapings week over week as his girlfriend. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was there every single week, yeah, sitting in the audience waiting to be acknowledged. <laughs> in thinking back on it now, it's such a funny thing to speak about it because, you know, they say that 
when you look back on your life and it looks like a film, then you're over it. And I really do feel that way. You know, the way that I speak about this person who was turning up to these recordings of Strictly Come Dancing in her pretty dress and nice new shoes and nice new makeup, just waiting to be told that I look nice by my partner because really that was how low the bar was set at that point you know (laughs) if he had said you look nice it would have felt like you know the sun had come through the clouds but I think about her as a completely different woman and she she is a completely different woman to me now like she's Mm -hmm. she's entirely different she would turn up to these recordings and be so proud and also so delighted I remember there was one week where he had done so well on the show and he had got some great marks for a Paso Doble with his partner. And I stood, I jumped to my feet and I was applauding and I was crying and a big camera got instantly wheeled in front of my face to like have a full HD shot of all this emotion from this girlfriend. And I was standing and applauding and clapping because I felt so relieved from seeing with my own eyes that they had been rehearsing like they said they were Hmm. up until 9pm. They hadn't been doing what I thought they'd been doing, which is having an illicit affair. And I was clapping and applauding in that audience because I felt so relieved that, yeah, I was a psychopath. This is such an apt metaphor that when we look back at ourselves in our narcissistic relationships, that it feels like a film, and we are often a character that we no longer recognize. That's not a bad thing. It's a reminder that growth can and does happen after these relationships. And when we look backwards, the key is to not see it from a place of shame, but rather from how far we have come. You know, and... I was just there going, thank God my brain doesn't work and that there's something wrong with me rather than be right about this. And lo and behold, that was the very evening where in that car park, he'd had to turn around and tell me that actually the following day that they were going to be in the papers because I was right all along and they had been having an affair. We will be right back with this conversation. Lay that evening out for listeners because I, of course, (laughs) held on to, I can't believe I'm sitting here talking to you because I watched every word of that story. Oh my gosh, this is such a, this is such a narcissistic story. But if you could, you go from the Paso Doble clapping, thank goodness they actually were rehearsing, I was wrong, I'm the paranoid one, there's something wrong with me. Take us to what happens after that. So I'm there in the audience and the recording ends And there's a gazebo in a car park outside the studio where the guests of the performers can go and get a glass of wine and champagne and and wait for their partners or the people that are in the show. And I'm there at the bar getting a, a glass of champagne, one for me and one for him. And I see his agent run through the gazebo. And I think that's strange. I am... I didn't know he was going to be there tonight. And everyone looks quite flustered. So I'm just sort of like totter out, you know, in my cute little shoes with my Prosecco, one for me and one for my boyfriend to say, well done. And I see the two of them having what looks like a crisis talk. And I go up to my boyfriend and I say, what's going on? And his agent just goes completely silent. And he looks ashen, this guy, you know, my boyfriend this is, well, both of them really, but completely ashen. And there's just silence. And I say, this is, are you ready for what I said? What have I done with my words? Of course. And his agent just looks at him and he goes, I think you better take her over there and tell her. We go over and this guy can't look me in the eye and he is fuming. I mean, he's absolutely livid. And at this point, I have no idea why. And I just, we're just standing there in complete silence. And I say to him, what's wrong? And he says, where are you sleeping tonight? And I say, um, at home. And he goes, no, you're not. So Mm. what is going on? You have to tell me what's going on. And he just roars at the sky. And then there's this pause and he says, the sun have got pictures of me and the dancer kissing. He doesn't look at me like he's looking over my shoulder. And I just, I'm telling you, when I relay this Next part of the story, it sounds like 
<laughs> I'm writing a screenplay or something, but I'm absolutely not. It was as though a line of white light, like a photocopier, started at my head and went through my body and filled me with what I now know to be complete empowerment. And I just smiled and said, hmm. oh, in my head, all I could hear is, he's not good enough for you and he never has been. And you were right. Hmm. You were right all along. But I didn't need to say anything. I didn't hmm. need to say anything at all. I just went, oh. And then he just, and then he said, I have to get them out of here before her husband hits me. And I said, I'm coming with you. And he went, no, you're not. And I said, I am. And then I turned to his agent and I said, don't let him go anywhere because he owes me this. And that was the evening. And P.S. what I should also state was that the night that those pictures were taken, pictures of the two of them kissing in the street was, were taken, was three days earlier. And it was my 32nd birthday. And I had been waiting for him to come home where I had prepared dinner. And I called him because he texted me saying, we're going out for a drink. And I said, I don't know what's going on, but I called my best friend and said, I feel like there's something wrong here. I feel like it's not okay. Am I, am I being precious about this? Am I being, you know, a, a brat to think that it's not okay for my boyfriend to go out with another woman on my birthday, especially a woman that he knows that I'm already paranoid about? When we are in a narcissistic relationship, we even start to doubt that two plus two is four. And we need reassurance about really fundamental truths. Her boyfriend went out with another woman, a woman that Rebecca had shared her concerns about. He went out for a drink with another woman on Rebecca's birthday. And Rebecca is the one who is wondering if she is being too neurotic, too needy, and too sensitive. That's what these relationships do to us. Her instincts were always right. But after we have been gaslighted long enough, we will inevitably gaslight ourselves. And I called him up and I said, please come home. And he shouted at me. And then he got home that later that evening and ate the half of the cold lasagna that I had prepared <laughs> and said in the doorway of my bedroom, I just wish you could see the two of us together and you would be able to see with your own eyes what a psycho you are. So <sighs> this whole thing, I mean, you talk about the dream. I mean, in a way, it is the dream. It is like Bobby from Queer Eye, you know, coming in and sorting my brain out for me <laughs> and giving me a whole new, you know, l load of soft furnishings and space that I never knew existed. But that was the evening. And then The Sun on Sunday ran with this headline and it was on the front pages about this affair that had happened. And what actually happened was I got asked for comment by a lot of journalists who offered me a lot of money to sell my story and to have my say as they put it to me, you know, it's, we thought it was only fair. And I was like, well, how good of you? I guess that I knew that whatever I had to say would be on their terms the second that I gave it to anyone else. So I released a statement on Twitter instead, prompted by the fact that my boyfriend made a public apology and didn't acknowledge me at all in it, at all. Yeah. We'd love for you to read the statement here because some people may not have seen it. And in your voice, I want people to hear the statement because... Honestly, we could have just had you read the statement and this could have been the whole episode. It's that good. <laughs> okay, I'll read it to you. So my statement reads, Hello there. My name is Rebecca Humphreys and I am not a victim. I wasn't sure whether to respond to events from the past week, but I feel the narrative has missed a couple of crucial elements that I would like to clear up. It's incredibly good of my boyfriend and his dance partner to apologize in the media. I've received nothing other than the support of my family, friends, and a host of strangers on the internet who all wanted to make sure I was okay. What I have also kindly received are many offers to sell my side of the story, but I would prefer for it to be on my own terms. Those pictures were taken on October 3rd. It was my birthday. I was alone at home when he texted at 10 p.m. saying the two of them were going for one innocent drink. We spoke and I told him, not for the first time, that his actions over the past three weeks had led me to believe something inappropriate was going on. He aggressively and repeatedly called me a psycho slash nuts slash mental, as he has done countless times throughout our relationship when I've questioned his inappropriate, hurtful behavior. But this whole business has served to remind me that I am a strong, capable person who is now free and no victim. 
I have a voice and I will use it by saying this to any woman out there who deep down feels worthless and trapped with a man they love. Believe in yourself and your instincts. It's more than lying, it's controlling. Tell some very close friends who, if they're anything like my wonderful network, will swoop in and take care of the logistics and of you. It's important also to recognize that in these situations, those who hold power over you are insecure and fragile, and their need for control comes from a place of vulnerability. I think it certainly does in his case. Despite everything, I hope he gets what he wants from this. I'm not sorry I took the cat, though. Love, Rebecca. It, it's the best Twitter post actually ever in the history of Twitter posts. And the I'm not sorry I took the cat, though, actually could have been the title of the memoir, which was actually where I'm like, okay, I love this woman. You always you always take the cat. You always take him, babe. So this statement gets posted. Mm -hmm. And then what, you just, did you post it at night and just go to sleep? Uh, no. What happened was I had a huge crisis of confidence throughout that mm. day. I wrote it on the Monday. So the day after the papers came out and consulted with almost everyone, including my therapist, who took one look at it and said, Rebecca, you have to post this because you have a voice. And I took that very, very seriously. And I just had this moment where I was sitting at this kitchen table and my friends were making me dinner, you know, and she was sort of taking all of the roast potatoes and the greens into the other room and said, you know, whenever you're ready. And I went, okay, okay, okay. And I sat there and I just went, I'm too scared. And then I just had this moment where I was like, Rebecca, I don't want to look back on my life and see any moments where I had an opportunity to assert myself and didn't take it. I don't want that for myself. And with that thought, I just went, uh, boom, and clicked send Ooh. and ran into the other room. And I just went, I've done it. And they went, okay. And then not 30 seconds later, I could hear my phone vibrating in the other room and it just didn't stop. It just didn't stop. And I, and I leapt up and I ran and I looked at my phone and everyone I knew messaging me, calling me. I opened up the laptop and I actually threw it at my friend, Belle. I, I was like, uh, uh, just look at it, look at it. I can't look at it. And she looked and she said, it's had 3,000 likes. And this was within 10 minutes. Oof. And honestly, it was wild. It was on the news at 10 in the UK. And it, it was a moment, really. Like people were retweeting it. Women's charities were retweeting it saying, you know, you might have noticed that in my statement, I very, very deliberately didn't use the word gaslighting mm -hmm. because I just wanted to lay out the behavior. And I, mm -hmm. I wanted to not be accusatory. I wanted the world to, the world to call it, not me. And that's exactly what happened. People were headlining, this is what gaslighting looks like. This is what this means. And the following day, I woke up and I was on the front page of every newspaper in the UK saying, this is empowerment. This is, this is what this means. And it was a real, it was just most amazing. It was the most amazing example for myself of when you step into your authenticity, people hear you. People really do. It was beyond viral. <laughs> It was the manifesto we wanted to hear, and in many ways, very powerful from you. You're an incredibly accomplished actress, writer. I mean, you're looked upon as like, oh, she must have her life together. She's wonderful. She's perfect. She's cool. And when you put that statement out there, you're like, okay, if this happened to her, it happened to me, it's not because I'm less than or foolish. Like, she has it all together, and... I this happened to me, and it happens to people, all people. It happens to women who are profoundly powerful and women who have no power at all. The universality of it, I think you really gave it voice. Everyone else might be empowered, and I understand <laughs> yeah. at that moment something shut down for you, but at this point, he didn't catch you two inches above the pavement. So this is going on. You're having your own personal experience. What were the initial days and weeks like after this post went out and the relationship ended? Well... It's, it's interesting that you say that because really at that point, that was 2018, and I really wasn't in the public eye at that point at all. Mm -hmm. He and I met on a sitcom. So we met on a TV show where, may I say, because, you know, why not? I had a, I had a bigger role than he did at that time. I was, I was sure. more castable at that moment in my life. Well, that was one of the first things to go. Mm. 
well because I allowed him to diminish my, me and my career in order to elevate his own for such a long time. And it felt like there was only room enough for one career in that house and it had to be his. So my career was gone. I mean, I, I walked out that night that those pictures were in the newspapers. I didn't have a boyfriend. I didn't have a home. I didn't have a job. I didn't have any income anymore. But what I did have was, it turns out, more self-respect than I would ever have given myself credit for. And a voice and my worth all of a sudden. And it's like you said earlier, there's no flat in the world that means as much as that. And I really, truly felt what that was like during that period of time. And it didn't matter. I also saw for myself, truly, during that time, because of how dramatic it was, because of how much I had lost and and how it was many people's worst nightmare, what happened to me. And so what I really, really got to take stock of was what love actually looked like, which was the love of my family and my friends who showed the hell up for me in that moment mm. and flooded me with respect, honesty, open and honest communication, their trust, their support, their affection, their care, all stuff that I had been missing in a relationship that I was labeling love. And suddenly I was like, oh my gosh, I felt so emotional living with my friends during that point because it was truly unfathomable to me that I could live under the same roof as people who behaved as though they enjoyed my company. And honestly, I felt completely enriched by, by that experience. And of course, I had a broken heart. And of course, this is something that people don't really speak about enough about when you leave those kind of relationships, leave emotionally abusive relationships, which is that there were points where I was just like, for no reason, for no apparent reason, I'm standing here and it's bonfire night in the UK and there are fireworks happening and I've got a hot dog in my hands and I miss him and I miss him and I know he's an ass mm -hmm. and I, you know, I know that he did all these awful things to me, but good God, I wish he was here and I, I can't tell you why that is. But those moments appeared and I felt like I could handle them. I felt like I could, yeah, because of, because of the love and support of everyone around me and the love and respect for myself that I had after asserting myself in that way. That's a profound point. I'm so happy you had it. And I couldn't agree more because as a psychologist who weighs in and works with folks on this every day, it's hard to create a social support network for someone. So some people would go through something not as public as you did, but certainly that moment of revelation, and they don't have support. Mm. And it's because they often become quite isolated in these relationships. So your story shows us the profundity in many ways how important support is to get to the other side because you have accurate mirrors, you have people who validate you, you have people who help you keep that gaslight turned off. Your story is sort of an incredible example of that and that there's that moment sometimes in these relationships, you suffer, you suffer, you get confused, you you sort of believe this hype, you go on the roller coaster ride. So when the entire cover is pulled off mm -hmm. and it's shown for what it is, in a way, you've actually kind of been doing the disconnection from the relationship for a long time. You were just waiting for that final piece of evidence. And then there it was. And so you had that support. And how has life been since? Because you've actually become a really important voice for this kind of emotional abuse and within relationships that often hasn't had a voice. And your your work has been really, really powerful to those of us who act in this world as advocates, as therapists. So how have you been doing? How, is, how has your process of healing been unfolding? Well, it's been, it's been hard work. Mm -hmm. It's not been easy because you know what? Mm -hmm. I realized quite early on that a lot of my healing process was going to take a lot of looking in the damn mirror. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for those of us who feel insecure and, you know, have a low sense of self-esteem as it is, you know, looking in the mirror can feel almost scarier mm -hmm. than just making the same mistakes until we die. Sometimes, you know, but it, it, you know, it took a lot of, of of boldness and bravery, and of course, that support network to step up and do that. And it has been the most challenging and rewarding four years of my entire life. Mm. I mean, my work has has flourished, no question, because I no longer go to auditions with a person going, 
well, doing doing their best to make me aware that my best probably won't be good enough in that meeting, you know. And now I, I you know, suddenly I didn't have that anymore. And lo and behold, there I am being handed work. And and of course, the revelations that I am discovering about emotional abuse and about, like you say, that it comes for strong, sexy, intelligent, cool women, as much as it does for women that we want to label victims in our society or the way that pop culture presents victimhood. I'm, I'm making all these discoveries that, oh man, that's wrong. And no one's talking about that. So I guess I will, you know, I guess that's, that's my job because I needed to know that when I was in that relationship and no one was talking about it. So now I need to say it because the idea that people don't know about this is just doesn't make any sense to me at all. So, you know, lots of my work has been about uncovering those things and finding ways to speak about them. I spoke in the House of Commons in the UK about gaslighting in the media and the media's portrayal of victimhood. And obviously, I, you know, I wanted to write this book and I had this idea to write the book. It was actually during the pandemic when I just had this real moment of going, what's happening in this world? I don't have any work, of course, but I'm there going thank God I'm not in that flat anymore. Thank God I'm not there. And when I had that thought, I thought, how many women in this country are living with partners and they have no idea that they are experiencing emotional abuse and someone needs to do something. Rebecca is sharing the classical story of thriving after a person gets out of one of these relationships. Narcissistic relationships are often a block. We stop taking risks. We hold back, we are afraid of their criticism, and we are afraid of our own success. Not only do our careers and pursuits often get diminished in these relationships, but so many people thrive when they are finally over. I think everyone in these relationships says, I know this isn't right, it's probably my fault. And people around them may also be thinking, well, relationships are just tough, so it's complicated. There's a point in the book where you questioned if you were becoming a narcissist. Mm. Why did you think that? Well, I suppose the reason I thought that was because when I came out of the relationship, I was so unaccustomed to thinking about myself and my needs and my experiences, Mm. my feelings. I was just learning that language. And I look back on that now and I think, no, I wasn't obsessed with who I was. I was just developing a healthy relationship with myself and my intellectual self and my emotional self. And I was developing a dialogue. But for me, a healthy dialogue looked like self-obsession because I never, I never had Mm -hmm, it before, mm -hmm. ever. Mm-hmm. I, I agree. Yeah, it's, 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 and so suddenly I'm there going, oh, all I can, all I can think about is myself, and you know, whatever. And all I seem to be talking about is myself. You know, am I a narcissist to my friends? And mm-hmm. they're sort of going, I don't think so. Many survivors have this experience of thinking that they themselves may be a narcissist when they are in these relationships. Whether it's because the other person is saying you are, because you are constantly ruminating about the relationship, because you find yourself talking about it all the time, or because you are thinking about what you need or what you want, that internal obsessive rumination is a classical part of the fallout of narcissistic abuse and gaslighting. And no, it does not mean you are narcissistic. Do you have any questions for me? I do have a question for you. And great. I suppose that there's a chance that I'm coming at this with too much empathy, really, given what we know about narcissists. But my question is, is that it has to do with are narcissists born or made? And is narcissism, uh, can, it, can it be put down to being a coping mechanism for something, for trauma? Narcissism in many ways is a set of defenses that protect the core insecurity of the person who has those defenses, being grandiose, being arrogant, being entitled, gaslighting, manipulating. In essence, everything is to maintain their sense of power and domination so they don't have to have that uncomfortable shame of having all of that percolate up. It's all an unconscious process. Here's where it gets tricky, Rebecca. I love your empathy, but the (laughs) fact of the matter is, is... Your number two, that that person in your life, he was able to turn on the charm and then very quickly, when he had you by yourself, called you a psycho. 
He wasn't mm. doing that in front of other people. He was doing that when he was alone with you so he wouldn't look like a bad guy. That's a choice. A person who was really that dysregulated would do it in front of everyone. Okay, that, that's a def definitely a different process. But he was very calculated. And that calculation requires a relatively high level of functioning. So he really was living in service to, I want my way, and I'll do whatever I need to do. And it's open season on my partner. I can say whatever I want to Rebecca because she's going to keep coming back. So rather than saying, I shouldn't say this to someone, I could hurt them, I could lose them, his schema was, I can always pull her back. I would say those defenses are a way of protecting the narcissistic person. Narcissism is made. There's a temperament narcissistic people have. There's a certain temperament as children they likely had, but not even that in every case. Mm. But the environment shapes them. And some narcissistic people, yes, are shaped by trauma and chaos and invalidation and issues with attachment. But some narcissists are shaped <laughs> by simply being overindulged and being told, you're more special than anybody else. And because some people do grow up with trauma and invalidation, in fact, most don't grow up to be narcissistic, there's something else operating there. It also can be that temperamental piece. So it's complicated. It's very complicated, but it's not fully a trauma reaction. There's enough people out there who didn't have that backstory, but ultimately many, many people who go through trauma, again, I'd argue most, don't end up narcissistic. But this idea that it's a coping mechanism, it is a defensive mechanism, but they know better because he would not have treated you the way he would have treated a casting agent. No. Right? The fact that he could make that discrimination <laughs> mean he knew he knew damn well what he was doing. Wow. I mean, it's fascinating. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. Thank you. Rebecca, thank you so much for sharing your story, your experience with it, not just the public story we saw, but what happened to you and how it is such a universal experience for so many people. Many people say, well, maybe it was something about me. I attract these people. I say, nah, the charm, the charisma, the stuff that drew you in with this guy would have drawn in anyone. Absolutely. And anyone in that situation being manipulated, it's a game of cat and mouse. The mouse never wins. Here are my takeaways from my conversation with Rebecca. First, in a narcissistic relationship, our heart breaks long before the relationship actually ends. The day-to-day -day of the relationship with the alternation between idealization and devaluation, rescue and abandonment, leaves a person who is in one of these relationships confused and hurt. It's a bit like breaking your leg in the same place every month. In Rebecca's story, the ultimate end and the moment of clarity when she realized that she had been gaslighted and devalued was actually a moment of clarity, not devastation. She had done the hard work of heartbreak over the years she was in the relationship. When she finally got confirmation of what it really was and saw it, that clarity carried her forward into her healing. In this next takeaway, these relationships only work when we make ourselves small, and that means abandoning our aspirations, our goals, selling ourselves short, and giving up on our own interests to support the narcissistic person's pursuits. We have to diminish our successes so as to not threaten them or harm their fragile egos. For many folks in or coming out of narcissistic relationships, they will find that they actually couldn't achieve what they wanted even if they tried while they're in these relationships. It's as though the relationship is a toxic blockade. And yet, once people get out of these relationships, they find themselves pursuing goals, making things happen, and going for it. Rebecca's story is not unusual of finding herself and thriving and finding her voice after she got out. We shrink ourselves so they can feel big. And sometimes getting out means a chance to finally fully occupy ourselves and shine. In my next takeaway, in Rebecca's book and in the interview, she shares the real original story of The Little Mermaid as told by Hans Christian Andersen. It's not the Disney version where the mermaid gets her voice and they live happily ever after. 
In the original, the mermaid gives it all up, including her voice, and lives in pain to win the prince over just to be rejected and die. Hans Christian didn't know he was writing the template for a narcissistic relationship. In the original stories of Snow White and Sleeping Beauty, men in power fall in love with or have non-consensual sex with sleeping women who also have no voice. In modern times, we have sanitized these fairy tales in a manner that romanticizes ignoring red flags with the promise of the happily ever after. Maybe keeping the fairy tales in their terrifying and tragic original formats may be more honest. Ultimately, these watered-down fairy tales create distorted expectations on what relationships are supposed to be. Perhaps we will one day have fairy tales that involve equity, respect, compassion, empathy, and kindness in the relationship, with everyone awake and nobody having to give up their voices to be in love. In a way, Rebecca's tale is a modern fairy tale. By getting away from the pseudo-prince, she gets her voice back. And in my last takeaway, Rebecca, like many survivors, had empathy for her partner's backstory, a childhood that was more difficult and bleak than her own and in a compassionate way would attribute his manipulative behavior to his tough backstory and give him a free pass. And this is something that many a toxic person also does for themselves. I just had a tough childhood. That's why I do these things. It's always hard to hear that someone had a tough start in life, but you aren't responsible for that. And using that as a justification for their bad behavior in the relationship misses the larger picture that the majority of people with difficult childhoods do not behave badly in relationships. Be careful at how much you let their backstory be a place where you justify behavior that is harming you. Because this can be a cycle that is almost impossible to break out of. A big thank you to our executive producers, Jada Pinkett-Smith, Fallon Jethro, Ellen Rakuten, and Dr. Romani Dravasala. And thank you to our producer, Matthew Jones, associate producer, Mara Della Rosa, and consultant, Kelly Ebeling. And finally, thank you to our editors and sound engineers, Devin Donahue and Calvin Bailiff.